Yep. Okay, so let's go ahead and start our presentation. Uh, what we're going to present about is growing math. And that's going to be by me, Christy Hansen, and Anne Maria DeMars. So I want to lead in by introducing myself today. My name is Christy Hansen. I'm the community manager of Seven Generation Games. And um, I'm from the Navajo Nation. I, I have a background in teaching. I taught eighth grade English on the Navajo Nation for two years. And I did one year of SAT and ACT prep in Seattle, greater area. And um, I wanna lead off with a quote um, by my Swedish friend from college. Um, way back when, when um, I was friends with exchange students, we would often talk about our culture and our language. And one day she said, our language will not survive unless our children use it while playing. And she has a very good point. Um, I told, had told her about our native language and um, she, she said, well, you know, to, in order to learn language, you have to use it in, you know, all, all your, your, the daily facets of life. And that includes play. And that's a very good way to engage students as they learn language. And um, so that's what we are doing in the Growing Math Project. Uh, we are helping students learn math through indigenous history and culture. Um, and that is led by Anne Maria DeMars. All righty, go ahead and let's introduce ourselves. Well, I'm Anne Maria DeMars. I am the president of Seven Generation Games, principal investigator of the Growing Math Project. I have taught math at every level from middle school through doctoral students. Most recently, I had the pleasure of teaching online for the Spirit Lake Nation when everybody went virtual to the middle school. And I'm also currently teaching biostatistics and epidemiology at National University. And of course, Brennan Growing Math. And um, I, as a former teacher, am now community manager. I, I think that um, I have brought a lot of my past experiences to this position and it gives me a lot of insight into what I'm currently doing for seven generation games. Um, our previous, the previous school um, and the Navajo Nation that I taught at was undersourced. And, you know, during the pandemic, I've seen, I've seen quite a lot through uh, my own mother's eyes as she's teaching in uh, Crown Point, New Mexico at a, at a BIE school. And this um, company is, is seeking to address the issues in learning that are coming up now during the pandemic. All right, take it away, Anne Maria. Well, what we're trying to do with seven generation games and growing math, as Christy said, is include the language and math in play. Because you think about it, children will play the same game over and over. And if they lose a life in Super Mario Brothers or whatever they're playing, then they try again. And yet often we see kids in school, if they fail at a math problem, they give up, they get discouraged. So what we're trying to do is bring that same level of interest and persistence that we see when kids are playing a game that they're really interested in, into learning math and history and indigenous culture and agriculture. And we'll talk a lot about how all of those go together. With the way indigenous culture gets into our software, our lessons and our games is because there has always everywhere been math, whether it is figuring out how far people went on each leg of the Ojibwe migration or figuring out what the profit is when somebody is a sheep rancher. There is math in everything and everywhere. And if you're making games, they need to have a story. So why not have stories that feature and celebrate indigenous cultures and history. In Growing Math, we have a number of components that we'll talk about quite a bit. One of those is lessons that are usually integrated with the, the games themselves. At Making Camp Navajo, which Christy will talk about quite a bit today, is our newest game that's coming up. We have 18 games available and three more under development and Making Camp Navajo will be the next one to come out. All of what we do in Growing Math is focused on being able to learn anywhere. So let's just 
get this out of the way. Anybody who teaches fifth grade, third grade, you did not start out three, four years ago thinking, I'm going to be teaching my classes online. My eight, 10 year old students are going to be sitting at home watching me on a computer. That did not cross anybody's mind, right? And that was sort of the, the impetus of the Growing Math Project that all of a sudden we were all thrown into this whole new system. So what we have developed is lessons that can be used anywhere in the classroom. If you have students learning remotely, if you have students who are, who are individually at home, or if you have a combination of that. For example, I was just at a school where most of the students were in the classroom, but there were a few students who were quarantined or for other reasons were in school. And so they were learning, they were coming into the classroom through their computer. How do you as a teacher find time to develop all of those different lessons? Well, and the truth is you don't. So that's why we've been developing a lot of it for you. Growing math is educational games, math games with storylines centered on indigenous history and culture. And as you can see an example here, this is one of the games that is a virtual world. Students are asked to find the herbs that are needed to treat an epidemic among their tribe and the actual herbs that were used were plants that would have been used traditionally by that tribe to, to treat illness. So there's educational games, there's paid professional development because no software is ever going to benefit students unless it's used. And teachers are already at the max with hybrid learning and distance learning and all of the other things that just come in with being a teacher generally. And if they need to take their time after school or on the weekends to learn new software, then they need to be paid for that. And teachers are the real experts on what's working, what's not working in the classroom. So if we can train teachers on how to use new resources effectively and get their feedback, it's a win-win. Data is behind everything that we do. We track how students are achieving, how many problems they've, they've attempted, how many of those they answered correctly, how much time they spent on task. So two ways of looking at time on task is how much time students are actually logged in, but then also how many learning activities they actually did, because they might be logged in a long time because they can't figure it out. So we track both of those things and tech support, because as one principal said to us, no matter how easy people say it is, it never is. <laughs> but as a developer, you think things are really clear and obvious, and then you find out, oh no, um, maybe not. So we provide tech support, troubleshooting. We really try to get back to everybody within one business day. And a lot more, most of that lot more is lessons, integrating all of this together. And we'll, we'll show you a couple of examples of that. Important thing, maybe I should have started off with this. We are supported by USDA funds. So there's no cost for the schools. The Growing Math Project is funded to provide resources for hybrid, remote, or in-classroom learning to schools in six states. And those states are Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Oregon, New Mexico, and Arizona. So any Diné serving school in grades three through eight would be eligible. We also have schools that have students say in ninth grade that are um, that that are a little bit behind, or we've had a class of gifted second graders. So the standards taught are third through eighth grade level. But if you have students who are older or younger that are hitting those standards, you're also welcome to participate as well. Stipends are provided for participating teachers, but also for paraprofessionals because they are very important in the classroom, as we well know, and are often providing supplemental instruction for students. And also for administrators, especially in small schools, we know that you often wear two hats, that you may be the superintendent and also the eighth grade math teacher. So anyone who is working with students at that age group, including after school programs, is more than welcome to participate in the Growing Math Project, and they would all be eligible for stipends. And another important thing to know, in addition to the fact that 
Growing Math is paid for, for you, by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, is that Growing Math supplements the current curriculum. Because I can hear superintendents or principals saying, oh, my Lord, we just paid for Achieve 3000. We just paid for Math XL, or we just paid for this other program. This sounds great, but do we need to now replace that? No. Growing Math supplements your current curriculum. So whether it's the when sessions that a lot of schools have, what I need, where now the homeroom is providing additional math instruction, whether it's the free choice period during your computer lab, or whether it's for those students that you have covered fractions with, but they still need a review, or that student who you are covering fractions with the rest of the class, but they've leapt ahead. So growing math is not a replacement for your current curriculum. And it's definitely not a replacement for your teachers. It is a resource to facilitate students learning math integrated with indigenous culture. And we'll show you how that works shortly. All of our software, all of our lessons are created with indigenous educators. And again, the teachers who are in the growing math project, if they are interested in creating lessons with us, we're ecstatic to have them participate and we will actually pay them per lesson. But if they just want to participate in the training and use all the software and lessons, that's great too. Everything we do is with the needs of students and tribal communities at the forefront. And Christy's going to talk a, a little bit when we get to the Making Camp Navajo project about how we do that as far as prototype and iteration and involve students and teachers. The problems we address are things that we've seen in rural schools, tribal schools throughout the country. And I would be astounded if you all listening to this didn't have the same issues in your school. One of them is attendance. Students just don't show up for class. And once we went to online learning or hybrid learning, it got worse. That some of the schools we work with, I personally in my class would often get 80 to 90% attendance and other people would say, oh, that's great. Well, me, I'm never satisfied unless I have 100%. So getting students to show up, getting them to log on is a major issue for most schools. Engagement. Even though I did really well at getting 80 or 90% of my students, sometimes 100% to, to show up. If you taught online, you had that, I know you had it, all the little black squares with their name in white and you say, what do you all think about this math problem, who, who, what, what's your idea? What do you think the proportion of, of twin lambs would be here? What do you think the number of twins would be here? Crickets, no answers. You think maybe all of your students died, the editors are all frozen. So getting that engagement is a real problem we address. And I could tell you one of the things I've done if you come to the growing math training, you'll learn about this. Having competition, I did not think this would work. I really didn't but was really effective for some students. Once I gave a seven generation games hoodie to the student who had the, the highest number of problems completed. Oh my gosh, in middle school, the big thing is fairness. Why did she get a hoodie? How many problems did she do? How many I need to get? So engagement, we have a lot of ideas for engagement, but that, that image just shows you know, one of the students in the program learning at home and she was just so over it. So that's an issue for a lot of us. Inclusion of culture and language. Even if you yourself are from that nation where you teach, do you have time to create lessons that integrate math? And if you're like Juliana Taken Alive, who was the, the co-project director with me on this, she says, well, I'm from the Lakota Nation. I know a lot about that. But if I'm teaching Navajo students, I don't. There's hundreds of Indigenous nations. So having the language and culture included is something that we work very, very hard on and very closely with experts, as Christy again will tell you very shortly, and implementing hybrid and remote STEAM for rural students so that they can have access wherever they are. Now, we've talked a lot about this. Christy, you want me to run the video? Let me just show it here. I have it all pulled up. I'll show you what's coming up. And then Christy will tell you all about what's happening next. Excellent. Hi there, I'm Rose Nez, or as we say in my Navajo language, Ya'at'e She'e Rose Nez, Yinishia. Let me tell you a little bit more about me. Torichi Nishle, Senjikine E Bashishin, Nakaidene E Rashiche, Ado, Oga E Rashinale. 
akot au at ed nashle. In English, that means I'm of the Bitter Water Clan. I'm born for the honeycombed rock people. My maternal grandfather was of the Mexican clan. My paternal grandfather was of the Hairy Ones clan. In this way, I am a girl. The way we introduce ourselves tells a story, our story. I've been thinking about stories a lot lately, my story and the stories of my ancestors. I've got all of these memories here in this book of photos of my family. Oh no. There's a lot of history in here, lots of good memories, but also some things that a lot of people want to forget. The truth about history is that it's not always pretty, but it's important to remember. My aunt says history is what happened. It's not what we wished happened. Otherwise, I would wish to have won the lottery and be the queen of the known universe. But seriously, as much as the past is filled with memories, it's filled with knowledge too. A lot of knowledge. Traditional knowledge that is just as useful today as it was generations ago. For example, my uncle always talks about how you shouldn't just jump into things. He says you need to first think about it then plan it out so you can make it happen. And when you're done, you reflect on what you did. He says it's part of our Diné philosophy. And these days, it's pretty good advice if you ask me. Just don't tell him I admitted that. Yeah, I'm never going to hear the end of that one. The better you feed your sheep, the more twin lambs you'll have. Ewes that are fed more in the weeks before breeding are more likely to have twins. So, Christy. Hello. All right. So, I'm going to review how the game was made. And let's see, let's share my screen. So, we all started out in the spring of this year. And what we did was we really wanted to plan out for the fall and we needed to help. Well, we needed to help their process along by asking consultants to join our team and our consultants had to be from the Navajo nation. Um, in the past, we've also hired consultants from uh, tribal nations like um, like the Turtle Mountain tribe and what else? Uh, what other tribes in the past? Uh, Spirit Lake Dakota. Yes. Uh, Spirit Lake Dakota. Dakota. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have three consultants on our project. And they include Albert Chase, Gina Johnson, and Michelle Whitstone. And they all have background in education. Uh, Albert Chase is known for his weaving demos and dances. Uh, Gina Johnson is known for uh, tutoring 
both native and non-native students and for for her uh, Navajo language tutoring uh, she she teaches um, both students and uh, people who want to learn like in general even non uh, even non-native people and Michelle Whitstone was also a contributor to the Navajo Rosetta Stone project um, for indigenous artists, we've we've also had indigenous artists on the project in the past, like Stephen Gladue for the Aztec games in our Aztec series. Uh, for making Camp Navajo, we we had Jeremy Arviso join our team for making all of the the hogans and the sheep and the the characters of making Camp Navajo happen. And um, he is part Diné himself and has uh, lived in the Southwest for his entire life and really knows what the landscape looks like. He also runs a design company and he he's a clothing designer, fashion designer. So that's what he does. Um, so for further developing uh, future iterations of our game, what we do is we create a prototype with our cultural consultants first, which is what we have done uh, this past summer and spring. And from there we begin testing uh, successive iterations of the game with students in their classrooms. So we did de we deploy it with um, uh, teachers through the teachers in either um, like uh, game design projects or we we partner up with with teachers who want to volunteer their students and they the students use the games and and potentially lessons as well. Um, we don't have a whole lot of lessons based um on making camp navajo yet but we we soon will uh, we're we're starting that process right now as well um any iteration um of the game is based on feedback from the students and the teachers and from there it just repeats and from from september we have our prototype of our making camp navajo game completed um but uh, more iterations need to happen and the English version will be complete in November. That's what we're shooting for. And from there, uh, our Dine language development begins and will end in spring of 2022. So at the end of next semester, we should have that complete. So Christy had talked about what we have in progress. And just so everybody knows, if you are interested in being part of that, prototyping, revising, iteration, and making Camp, making Camp Navajo, hit us up. We will put the link in the comments. We'd be very, very happy to hear from any schools. You don't have to wait till making Camp Navajo is done. You can be part of the development. So what, 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 we have, what do we have for you right now? Well, we have 18 games. We have 70 lessons. It'll probably be more like 72, 75 by the time you watch this. We have 300 videos. And we have a lot more than that. We have data reports that show you how the students are progressing. We have weekly newsletters, which Christy edits. We have three of those. We have a blog, again, which Christy edits that will give you a lot of news and information and new resources coming out. And we have virtual manipulatives like um, online applets for probability selection. We have a lot more than we'll be able to talk about in one hour. Just to give you an idea, we have the math, the universal language series, which you can see here is augmented reality apps in Lakota in English, Dakota in English, Spanish in English. We'd really love to come out with the Navajo in English one. So you can see here, the students are holding the iPad or phone over these cards, and then it shows the answer to the problem. And they can click on a button and hear that answer in English or in another language. We also have the Making Camp series that starts with multiplication of single digit numbers at Making Camp Ojibwe and goes up through ratio and proportion in Making Camp Navajo. So those are kind of collector type games. We've got Forgotten Trail, which is a combination of Ojibwe history and learning fractions and statistics. There's the Spirit Lake and Fish Lake games. Spirit Lake runs on Mac and Windows. It, as you can see, is a a virtual world where you learn Dakota history and multiplication division. Fish Lake runs on Mac, Windows, and iPads and teaches fractions in Ojibwe history. And then there's the Aztec Games series, which teach statistics and are incorporated with Latino history, including Aztec and Maya. All of our lessons are 
center our standards aligned and we're aligned with common core standards and if you say oh we don't teach common core well we teach standards that i am sure everyone covers things like adding fractions with common denominators or writing a sent complete sentence so all of our lessons will tell you right up front this is the standard the student will learn all of them are cross curricular this is a hill i will die on i am convinced and i think most of the people in our company are as well that children learn math better when it's in context when it's there are two different tribes and they're they're on the plains and where's the most fair place for them to meet if they're six days right apart there's a lot of indigenous content in our games it could be geography it could be history culture science i know christy's done a couple of lessons on medicinal plants and almost all of it in, in, includes math Usually, not 100% of the time, but, but usually we will integrate games with that. We always include assessment. How do you know if the student's learning? It could be whole class assessment. It could be open-ended assessment. I know like some of the, the lessons that Chris, the lesson that Christy's going to show, or it could be straight math problems. You know, what is the product of 11 and 66? All of our lessons can be used in hybrid or remote classrooms, as well as within within a classroom with your students. So I've talked about the lessons. Christy's going to show you an elementary school example, and then I will pick up with a middle school one. Take it away, Chris. Thank you, Anne Maria. <clears throat> so this is what our our website looks like. And the lesson I want to present about today is called All About Sheep. And this lesson supports Common Core State Standards uh, with, with two of them here, where students can write an opinion piece on topics or texts, um, supporting a point of view with, um, with like reasons or uh, support from the text. And they can also write uh, an informative or an explanatory piece to examine a, the, the topic of the sheep and convey their ideas information clearly within their piece of writing as, as assessment. Um, this is for third and fourth grade ELA and blended with agriculture. And um, I developed it like for, uh, well, because growing math uh, focuses a lot on agriculture, it both like you can teach it in a, in a, in a setting where you know maybe you're not covering native history, but you can also use it if you are covering uh, Navajo history uh, with with sheep too. So um, this this ELA lesson uh, con consists of those two short activities um, where you can pre-teach vocabulary with uh, some flashcards, um, and you can also um, use an ebook uh, that I've provided in here that I've written myself. Um, so students can do those two activities first. They do need to have uh, access to a computer or a tablet with internet for remote learning. So um, teachers can also print out the cards for, for the students and, and send them to the students. Or what, what the Navajo Nation has been doing is uh, having resources at the school and uh, the students' parents come to pick them up as well. So. Here is a downloadable set of flashcards where it pre-teaches um, their vocabulary in the ebook, like fold, that's a small sheep pen, sheep dog is a dog that guards the sheep, shepherds are, are people who guard, protect, and herd sheep. Uh, there's lamb, ram, and you. <clears throat> the ebook is in Book Creator, it's accessible to everybody. And I, I developed the content for this and also included a voice recording of myself reading that. This sheep was moved to a pasture, which has plenty of fresh green grass for it to eat. So students can listen to that. If they listen to it all the way through, it takes about 10 minutes, whereas like reading it might be a bit faster for, for some, some of the, um, the faster students. And um, so, the opinion writing prompts are here and the informational writing prompts are, are here as well. So um, like they can respond to uh, the story by um, answering the question might like, like, well, if I had wool, I would make 
uh, if I could feed a sheep a snack, I would feed it. Or for the informational writing bits, um, they can reflect on the text, like why are sheep important to us? What resources do they give us? Because that's covered in the ebook. And why do sheep need a shepherd? And to go beyond the text, uh, they can answer questions like, well, why might it be important to put colorful markings on a, on a U on her lamb? That's just uh, starter questions. You could definitely ask uh, more questions and expand on the text um, by, by reading it yourself first. And uh, if, uh, if you're doing book reviews in your class, like uh, many teachers do, you can have students write about uh, this book as well. And students can tell our young readers what the book was about and um, include their own evaluation or interpretation about this book. And my favorite is if you could feed if you could feed a sheep a snack. I could just see, you know, I have a a granddaughter that's in the fourth grade, and I could just see her really being into answering that. So, Christy talked about the a lesson for elementary school. As we've said, we have lessons that address standards for grades three through eight. So, I wanted to show you the an example of what you can use for middle school. Now, if you want to just find anything at all that say on rational numbers or sheep, you could type it in the search box here. That would search everything in the whole site. But let's say I am interested in just lessons, just complete lessons, and I'm going to look at seventh graders. So this gives me a bunch of lessons. I want to go follow along Christy's sheep <laughs> sheep motif. So I'm going to click here on raising sheep and rational numbers. And as Christy said, all of these lessons are going to start with standards. So here's the Diné culture standard here. I will develop an understanding of Diné way of life. Uh, and then there's a common core math standard on solving multi-step real life and mathematical problems with positive, negative, rational numbers. Every one of our lessons starts with an estimate of the time it takes the technology required. This one, if students have any device that will connect to the web, phone, Chromebook, anything, it will work. The, each lesson starts with a summary, a, why would a Navajo sheep farmer need rational numbers, and gives you a very brief overview of what the lesson's about. This one starts with a bell ringer. So this is kind of a more advanced version of the All About Sheep that Christy did. This is a really interesting video that is an interview with a Navajo sheep farmer. And students, again, talking cross-curricular, write answers to the prompts, like what did they notice? And then we get into my favorite part, which is the math part. And as I said, teachers are busy, right? So we don't assume that you had time to create an entire lesson, but we did it for you. All of these resources are freely available. You're more than welcome to go in and you can make a copy into your Google Classroom and modify it to your heart's content. So we start here, similarly introducing the vocabulary. Obviously, since it's middle school, we're using words like semi-nomadic, you know, as opposed to you. Um, we're giving a, a little more age-appropriate vocabulary. And then here we dive into rational numbers. And I'd say I, like most of you probably, if you're experienced, see that the the issue that many new teachers have in math is they just jump in and assume students know things that haven't been explained yet. Like, what is a rational number? So after that introduction, we go through rational numbers and how they could be used in sheep raising. Like one example is negative numbers. You buy everything you need at the beginning of the season. And so then you have a negative amount, right? You owe the bank. And at the end of the year, after you've sold wool and you've sold lambs, now you have a positive number, you add those two together, and that's how much money you've made. So there's a number of assignments like that. At every point, we do direct teaching and give you the rules for integer addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And there is, like in Christie's example, a number of different assignments where you're looking at how much money you're making. There's another one further on down where you're computing the value of computing the value of the cost of building a corral. So we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but it just gives you an idea of the types of resources that are set up for you. And we go through all these in obviously a lot more detail in the growing math lessons. So there's our 
lesson. After that, you can go on and play the game. So you have had your bell ringer, you had some introduction on how people raise sheep, you've gone through and had an extensive, probably 25 minute math lesson on rational numbers and done some problems together as a class. Then you play the game Making Camp Navajo. You saw one example of that in the video. And there's also a couple of other sections on rational numbers, what is a ratio. We try whenever possible to include differentiated instruction. So as in Christy's example, students who are um, struggling readers can have the ebook read to them just by clicking on it. And again, we try to do things that can be done when students are learning remotely or in the classroom. For this one, for differentiated instruction, if your student needs a review of the basics on what are rational numbers, there's a video they can watch. We also try to include wherever possible related lessons. So if they needed a little more reinforcement on adding and subtracting decimals, there's an earlier lesson on the Growing Mouse site. And again, we end up with assessment as always that there's the problems in the presentation and that, that they can do as a whole class or as Christy said, you can print those materials out when they pick them up, they can take them home and do them on their own. And teachers can also look at the reports and see what standards students have addressed in the in the Making Camp Navajo game. So we're working on that as we speak. And there are many, many, many more resources, far more than we could be covered in this one presentation. We've just really scratched the surface. And that's why we are available to train schools. And as I said, all of this is funded through USDA. The educators are paid for their professional development. There's Maria and I are two of the trainers. There's Annette, there's Juliana Taken Alive. As you can see, there's Christy here and Deanna Sanchez. So all of us are available to provide training. The next training dates are September 25th from 11 to 1 Mountain Time. I believe Arizona's the Mountain Time, um, 12 to 2 Central, Wednesday, October 6th, and Saturday, October 23rd. However, if you have three or four teachers at your school and say none of those times work for you, and you'd like us to set up a time specifically for your school, just email us at growingmath at sevengenerationgames.com and we'd be happy to do that for you. You can also, right here, we'll, we'll put this link in the chat. We'll also put it below uh, in the comments. You can sign up for training and we are really looking forward to meeting you at our next Growing Math training. So that's all I have to say, Christy. Do you have anything to add? I love training our teachers to use our growing math resources. So if you sign up, um, I really hope to see you there. I'll be more than happy to let you in on what we're doing. And don't forget about our quarterly art contest as well. Uh, that was how we, that's another way that we engage our students uh, in the community who use growing math. And we have, as, as we mentioned, so many things going on. So we would just love, love, love to have you meet, meet up with us, email us, text us, whatever you want to do. We're happy to hear from you. So yeah. Do you have something to say in, in Diné that means uh, we'd love to meet you? I don't know how to say that to me. Well, I could say thank you. Like, yeah, <laughs> love and take care of that whole yeah. All right. And I will just say hasta pronto. See you soon.